So you guys have been going through the life of David. Um, I'm not going to pretend to know exactly how Lieutenant Justin has been preaching it, but he did tell me where we are in the text um, this week. Um, and so we, we're just coming out of David becoming the king, right? We discussed that last week. David, towards the, end of the ser- uh, towards the end of the message, had just became king of all of Israel, not just the southern or not just the northern, but southern and northern kingdoms. He has now, right? So now we're in this point where we are in 2 Samuel chapter 5. And what we're going to see here, if you are a person who carries a Bible, it's going to be very valuable to you to get to get to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Use your phone, uh, whatever. I'm the kind of person who in a text like this, I will read it and preach it as we go. So that being said, we, we're going to start in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 6. And it reads as such. David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. The Jebusites taunted David, saying, you'll never get in here. Even the blind and lame could keep you out for the Jebusites thought they were safe. And so here's the thing. Sometimes you need to recognize that you are leading people, whether you whether you know it or not. People look to you. People see the way you act and they follow your movement. Even if you don't feel like a David, even if you don't feel like a leader, even if you don't feel like a pastor, like a like you might see some leadership in your community. Maybe you don't feel like that. But every little thing you do is leading that situation in one direction or another. That can be good. That can be bad. It's all depending on you. So we see here that David led his men, right? He didn't lead someone else's men. Sometimes you can only influence the people who are close to you and you don't need to worry about those who are far away from you. Who? What about that person over there? Don't worry about them. Lead the people that God has put in your life. And where do you lead them? Well, it's interesting because it goes on to say in the verse that um, David led his men to fight against the Jebusites. How many people in your life do you know who are going through daily battles? Sometimes they're daily battles of uh, emotional struggles like depression or anxiety, fear. Maybe there's some daily battles that look like health issues. We talked about those during prayer. Maybe there's some daily battles about the spiritual warfare that we're going through. Right. And so there's maybe even some of you are dealing with battles yourself. You know, let's not overlook ourselves here. But the thing is that David led his men to fight. Who did he lead him to fight? Well, he led them to fight the Jebusites who looked like they belonged there. Sometimes you will find situations in your life, more often than not, actually, especially as a Christian, you will find situations in your life that look like they're supposed to be that way. It looks like I'm supposed to be sick. It looks like I'm supposed to have this uh, depression or this anxiety. It looks like I'm supposed to have this financial struggle. But the truth of the matter is it's only there for you to overcome. Right. What victory? What does victory look like if you don't have to fight for it? You're just always the winner. There's never an opponent. Would you watch a basketball game if it was just one person playing? No, it's boring. There's supposed to be an opponent and your opponent might look like they belong against you. But the truth is they're just there long enough for you to overcome them, whether that's depression, anxiety, health issues, financial issues. Maybe it's an understanding. You're not understanding a situation. It could be anything. It could be people, physical people. Maybe your neighbor, you have trouble with them. That relationship is there to help you learn how to overcome frustrating people. It's not there for you to be bullied. It's not there for you to feel like you're less than valuable. It's there to show you who you are in God's eyes, because God has equipped you with everything you need, not only to lead yourself, but to lead those around you. And David saw that, right? David was not blind to who God had made him. I think it's beautiful that uh, we sing that uh, the song about Psalm 34 was sung. You know, David, he knew who he was so much that all like he was able to do anything he wanted to do in his, in essence to get to where God was leading him. So in this Psalm where what's actually happening in the reality is David's got his beard and his hair and he makes it look all rough. And the picture that scripture paints in that context is he's drooling from his mouth like a crazy man. And the King says, this man isn't the David I've heard about. I'm not worried about him. 
He ends up leaving David alone and David just cleans himself back up and he's back to being on, he's back to being in charge. It doesn't, the point I'm trying to make with that is that it doesn't matter how other people see you. It matters how you see you. It matters that you look at the situations in your life knowing that God made you an overcomer. You are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And when you know that, you move like that, right? So let's look at how David takes this and he fights. I love this verse. It says the original inhabitants of the land. You know, sometimes it looks... So we talk about... So I struggle with depression and anxiety. That's usually where my battlefields are, right? So it looks like depression belongs there. When I feel anxiety, if you're anything like me and you experience anxiety, it might be like, oh, why do I feel anxious? There's something I'm missing and I start looking for the thing I'm missing. And once I figure it out, the anxiety disappears. And I'm like, oh, that's why I was anxious. Really, it was just me needing to take control of this situation. But the funny thing is, it's all the same to say that's a spirit. The anxiety doesn't belong there to guide me. The Holy Spirit belongs there to guide me. The health issue doesn't belong there to guide you. It belongs there to be overcome by you, to lead you into a greater level of Christ likeness. And it's funny, some of the problems we face taunt us. That's what these Jebusites are doing. It says that the Jebusites taunted David saying, you'll never get in here. You'll never get over this health issue. You'll never get over this emotional conflict. You'll never get over this frustrating relationship. You ever had thoughts like that? I know I have. But just because the problem says you don't, you won't beat it doesn't mean that you won't beat it. That means that the problem says you won't beat it. Again, we go back to this concept of an opponent, right? Your opponent is supposed to think that they can beat you, right? But I am supposed to know that I will because I'm, I've got the power of, uh, excuse me, I've got the blood of Jesus over my life. And so they're telling David, you'll never get in here. Even, even the blind and the lame could keep uh, uh, even the blind and the lame could keep you out. It's funny because what they're saying is someone who doesn't see and someone who doesn't move. Do you guys know anything about idols? They have mouths but don't speak. They have eyes but don't see. They have ears but don't hear. And they have legs but don't move. And here you have people who worship idols telling David that even their idols essentially can keep them out. Even those who can't move and who can't see can stop you from overcoming this issue. That's what we're seeing here. Even the blind and the lame could keep you, sick, keep you out. For the Jebusites thought that they were safe. Don't let the confidence of someone else or the problem, don't, don't ever let the, the problem tell you that it's bigger than you. Because you know the God who is bigger than the problem. So we go on here. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David. So David knew who he was. He knew he was bigger than the problem. And he knew no matter what anyone else said, I'm going to overcome this now. I am the person that God has called to do this. I am moving with the power and authority of Jesus Christ. I am going to overcome this issue. This fortress is not going to stop me. And then David takes it over. It's beautiful from here because on the day of the attack, this is verse eight. On the day of the attack, David said to his troops, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. So now he's pointing the. they said that a, that a blind or a lame person could stop them from fulfilling the will of God. And then David calls it back at them like they're blind and lame. They could, I, I can't stand them. I hate them, right? Whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through the water tunnel. That is the origin, that is, excuse me, that is the origin of the saying, the blind and the lame may not enter this house. So David overcomes this. David gets into this fortress despite what everyone says, despite what it looks like, despite how big this problem seemed and how against David everything felt. He never was faced. He takes it over. Now look at what he does. Verse 9. So David made the fortress his home. Sometimes God gives you a... What's the scripture? It says uh, God comforts you so that you can in turn comfort those with the same comfort that he gave you. I don't know the address. I can look it up and get it back to you. But here's the point. Sometimes you have a problem so that you can over overcome it so that you can give the comfort God gave you into someone else with that problem. Let me show you what that looks like more practically. I had depression. God showed me how to overcome depression. Now I go and talk to people who have depression and help them overcome it with the same tools God gave me to overcome it. 
Here's another tool. Anxiety. I had anxiety. I, re- I recall there was a day where I was getting overrun with anxiety. My chest was tightening up and I literally was struggling to breathe and I was at work. So I go into a little closet at my job place and I just sit down and, and it says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, submit your request to God and make no, uh, submit your, submit your prayer to submit your prayer or with prayer and thanksgiving submit your prayer to God and let uh and let your supplication be known then the peace of God which surpasses knowledge and understanding will guard your hearts and your mind so I went to my room or my closet and I sat down and I started thanking God and praying for five minutes and then from that moment the peace of God started to guard my heart and guard my mind guard my heart and guard my mind and, and I'm telling you that because now I have that tool. And when I talk to people who struggle with anxiety, I can equip them, right? Sometimes you can make your problem a homestead for you where this is no longer something that rules me. I rule anxiety now. Depression is not something that has control over me. I have control over it. Health does not something that has control over me because by his stripes, I am healed. And you can step into solution and release that to people. So David, and that's what makes this beautiful. David made this fortress that was against him his home. And then David called this and then, excuse me, and he called it the city of David. He extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces and working inward. And David became more and more powerful. Why? Because God, because the Lord God of heaven's armies was with him. This is not about David. This is about uh, this is about God. It's not about how big and strong and smart and funny and fast and rich and anything. It's not. It's about the fact that that's David's God. He's able to say, Yahweh is my God. I surrender to him and he provides the victory and he turns that battleground into a place where I can rest. And that's what we see here in David, in this story with David. Um, and the last ver- or well, we got a few more verses here. Then King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with cedar, timber and carpenters and stonemasons. And they built David a palace. So now what was the biggest? Not only was it his what now what was the battlefield? Not only did it become his home, it become a place where he celebrated. Right. It's a palace where David is exalted as the king. Sometimes your problems will become a place where God puts you up and says, this is my work. And now it be done in your life. Right. That's the power of a testimony by the blood of the lamb and the power of the testimony we overcome. And David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king. I'm trying to get through the scripture real quick. We got a breaking point. Your food is back there, but I'm going to tear through this real quick. Um, the Lord has confirmed him as king. You don't have to confirm yourself. Quit worrying about what you are and let God tell you what you are. He says you're chosen. He says you're forgiven. He says that you're not forsaken. He says that you are a son of God. He says that you are reconciled. There is no condemnation for you. Let this word tell you who you are and quit trying to tell everyone else who you are. I hope you understand what I'm saying, because right here it says David realized that the Lord confirmed him as king. David didn't go around telling people who he was. God told people who he was over Israel and had blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. After moving on from Hebron to Jerusalem, uh, David married more concubines and wives, and they had more sons and daughters. And these were the names of David's sons who were born in Jerusalem. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, uh, Jephiah, Elishama, Elida, and Eliphelet. It's a mouthful. Know this. Of everything I just said, what we saw right here is David had a battle where, every, where the, his enemy was telling him, you can't beat me. David saw this and said, I have God on my side, took that, made that not only his victory, but he made it his home and he made it a throne where he can exalt God. He can lay his crown at the foot of God and say, by God's grace, this is now my city. And the people exalted him by creating a palace for him in that city. Do you want that in your problem today? Do you want your problem to become a place where God is exalted and you can rest in the middle of that problem? Because that's what we just saw David do. And if you want to know how to do that, You'll have to wait till after we eat because the, 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 so the, the uh, what is it? The key to making this happen in your life is in the next portion of scripture, which will come after we eat.
And I'm going to finish um, up our scripture today. It's a fun conversation that you can have. Is Jesus coming back today, tomorrow, next month, next year? Do I get to live my life? But I tell you, the one thing that matters is that he is coming back. And whether we know the time or not, he doesn't even know the time. But whether we know the time or not, we can rely on living inside of the principles we see in the word to be our guide, no matter how long or short our journey may be. And that's where I want to pull our attention back to David, right? We've been looking at how David took this fortress, took this stronghold by storm and made it his own, made it the city of Zion. Have You guys know what Jerusalem is, right? You've heard of this city before. It's that, that's the city. City we're talking about when when he when David did this though this wasn't just some little problem this became a monumental fixture in the biblical narrative of who and where uh, of of who God's people are where they congregate and and some would even argue as far as to say where Jesus comes back at um, there's there's different scholars that interpret that differently but it's it's all in the same area. Um, so to speak. So I want to get to this point now. We, we talked about the problem and the solution, right? David had this problem, this city. They were taunting him and he couldn't get in. And then he ends up coming in through the water tunnels um, and they end up taking the city by storm, uh, making it uh, the city of Zion. It becomes the city where David's palace is put. How did he do that? And the next context of Scripture actually unpacks how David thinks and how David wars. So we saw the aerial view, if you want to call it, of David fighting and taking over this city. Now let's look at David as he conquers the Philistines. So that was David capturing Jerusalem. We didn't see much of the battle aspect. Now we're going to see the battle aspect of David. In verse 17 of chapter 5 in 2 Samuel, it starts by saying, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces, not just some, but all of their forces, and uh, all of their forces to capture him, talking about David. So now you have the Philistines amass the biggest army they could and went out trying to capture David. Well, how does David respond? Well, David was told that they were coming, so he went into the stronghold. You know that the Lord is a strong tower for you. The Lord is to be a stronghold for you. The Holy Spirit is to be a stronghold for you. So you could say to yourself, David ran into the Lord. You could say that David ran into the word. David ran into prayer. David ran into worship. He ran into a place that was fortified and protected him, even though all the Philistines were coming against him. The Philistines arrived and spread out across the valley of Rephaim. And so now David is seeing this army in his stronghold. What does he do? So David asked the Lord. David prayed. That's what that's saying right there. David asked the Lord. He said, Lord, should I go and fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? He didn't say, oh, I've got to fight them. God, make me strong. He said, God, should I even fight this battle? Does this even belong to me? Will you even provide victory in this battle? Or am I going up against something that you didn't call me against? Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about David and Bathsheba, which you will study in, in a few months or in a few weeks, is um, that it was the season when kings go to war and David stayed home. David was supposed to be fighting a different battle that day than the battle he fought on the rooftop when he when he encountered lust. Sometimes you got to know when it's your battle, when you're supposed to flee the devil or when you're supposed to resist the devil and let him flee or when you're called to literally take captive thoughts and bring them into submission. Those are two different things that you are doing right there. And my point to you is pray, ask God, is this a battle you are calling me into? That's what David does. You know what? The Lord replied, don't just pray and go do what you want. David prayed and waited for God to answer. So again, starting in verse 19. So David asked the Lord, should I go fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, yes, go ahead. I will certainly hand them over to you. So David went to Baal Parzim and defeated the Philistines there. The Lord did it, David exclaimed. Do you win battles and start taking all the credit from God? Got to be honest, I do it. There are days where I'm like, God, give me the strength to do X, Y, or Z. And then he gives me the strength. I do it. And I'm like, look at man, I did pretty good there, didn't I? 
We got to stop that. We got to know that I asked God for this battle. God said, yes, I had I had peace. God gave me whatever it took to lead me into that battle. And God provided the victory for me through me. And, and in that situation, understanding that you might have won, but you but God is the reason you won. That is the first step to David's battle plan that you see. David prayed and David gave God the credit. So let's move on. David exclaimed, he burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So he named the place Baal Perazim, which means the Lord who burst through. The Philistines had abandoned their idols there. These people worshiped. They spent time. They spent a lot of sacrifices to these idols. And David came with the Lord ready for battle. And it was so much for them that they left abandoning their idols. Think about like there are things people idol in our world today, like gold, money, cars, houses, relationships that maybe they should or shouldn't be in. Phones. Phones. Could you imagine showing up to a battle place and watching them run away from all the gold and cars and all the money, all the all the houses? You're like, they just they didn't even try to take it with. That's what David sees here. The, well, that's a. That's an easy correlation for you then. Your mind is able to picture that because you've already seen it. So let's look further. So David and his man, men confiscated them. But after a while, the Philistines returned again. What do you think David does? They're spread out across the valley. The battle is back on. I already won once. I should be able to take them again. God gave me the blessing a while back. I'll fight them again. No, David stops and he goes back into prayer. He said again, David asked the Lord what to do again. David asked the Lord what to do. And here's the thing. If David would have said, God, what should I do? Waited for a minute and then took off without waiting to hear what God had to say in return. David would have died in this day. You know why? Because God responds and God says, do not attack them straight on. The Lord replied, instead, circle around behind and attack them near the poplar trees. When you hear the sound of sound, when you hear a sound like men marching on the tops of poplar trees, be on alert. You think David would have done that if God, if he didn't stop to see where God was leading him? He would have just ran into battle, assuming if God would have just said, yes, sometimes God gives you context. God gives you the keys to the battle. And for David, that looked like running behind the enemy, as odd as that sounds, and listening for God to move in his life first. Some battles aren't meant to be yours. You're just meant to watch God win them. That will be the signal that the Lord is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. So did David hear God's plan and say, that's a good plan, God, but we're strong enough. We beat him last time. We're just going to go charge him head on. No. So David did exactly what the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. So here's the thing. We talked in the first part of this uh, speaking of, of my little message. We talked about how David took over this this city. Now we're talking about how David wins his battles through prayer and waiting on the Lord. And so when you piece those two things together, if you really want to be a man after God's heart like David, it starts by not being afraid of anything you encounter in your life and going to God for every single battle you find. I will never fear anything that stands against me and I will go to God for everything that I'm dealing with. That's what David's, that's what David's life is testifying of in this story. And so my challenge for you don't be afraid of anything you deal with. You know, the Bible says that there is no love and fear, but perfect love casts out fear. You know, God is love. God has called you to live absent of fear. There is only one kind of fear you should have, and that's fear of the Lord. Every other fear should be gone from you, no matter what stands against you, no matter where, when, or how. Nothing is, a, I am afraid of nothing, and I carry it all to God. To the point where you would be on a battlefield peeing your pants from war. David's on a battlefield, not scared at all because God told him you will win this battle. That's the point when you move in the power of God, fear is absent. 